It was nearly the end of the 1908 season of navigation on the Great Lakes. Yet, as November began to expire, there was still a continuing parade of vessels heading up and down through the Sioux locks. Okay, so this photo was taken in 1904. Just stand back and squint and we'll pretend it's 1908. Among the dozens of lake boats locking upbound on Monday morning, November 30th, were a crowd of five that came up all at the same time. Under the command of Captain McIntyre, there was the Canadian grain boat A.E. Ames, as well as Captain Blair's package freighter Northern Wave. Crowding into the Polak was the 545-footer Abraham Stern, under the guidance of Captain Rand, plus the 468-footer D.M. Clemson, under Captain Samuel R. Chamberlain, who was making his final trip before his retirement. It's likely that Captain Milligan decided to pass the canal or Fairmount through the Hoitzel Lock, because there was probably no room left in the Po. No sooner than the five upbounders began to clear, the big ore boat L.C. Waldo squeezed her way in and headed downbound with a cargo of iron ore. When she cleared, the brand new 550-foot lake boat J.J.H. Brown locked up and joined the fleet, headed into Lake Superior. She was under the command of Captain F.D. Chamberlain. Some of the vessels, such as Captain F.D. Chamberlain's J.J.H. Brown, took the North Shore route up the lakes, which is considered to offer the best shelter in a gale. Some, like Captain Samuel Chamberlain, however, took the South Shore route. It would cut through the Portage Seaway and was a shortcut to the head of the lakes. None of the ore boats kept sight of one another for very long, as the snow began to soon swallow them all up. Of these six vessels that cleared Whitefish Bay, only five would ever leave the big lake. An unusually strong late-season storm was forming just to the west of the lakes. This is the actual forecast weather map of November 30th, 1908. What's good about these maps is that they not only set forward a forecast, but they also plotted the history of weather system movement. Here we see a single low pressure system setting up in the central plains. It was combined with a second low coming from the south. These two merged into a single low and rapidly tracked to the northeast. A third low was headed down off the Canadian prairies. All three then combined southwest of Duluth to form a monster storm. This arrow is the mapmaker's way of not only saying what direction the storm is headed in, but also to say that it's a fast-moving storm. The letters CW, seen here, indicate a cold wave. And notice that it is printed in red that the change in temperature with this storm will be a drop of between 20 to as much as 40 degrees. The tight spacing of these isobars indicates strong winds. The S inside the arrow indicates heavy snow. This was a truly fast mover that would pass over the lakes and expend itself in less than 48 hours, as this map from December 1st shows. Although storm signals were flying at the Sioux on November 29th, the vessel masters normally took the warning with a large grain of salt and sailed right out into the storm. Two days after the storm passed, the steamer Algonquin, under the command of Captain Charles Robin, locked through at the Canadian Sioux and reported passing through some floating wreckage west of Whitefish Point. Later that same day, the canal steamer Wasaga, under the command of Captain McKay, locked through the Canadian Canal and reported the same thing. Also, the turret court locked down through the Canadian Sioux. Captain Bolt reported passing through wreckage off Crisp Point, most of which consisted of wooden hatch covers painted red. That clue drew many to conclude that the lost vessel 
may be the big wooden steamer Tampa, who had hatch covers painted red. That 310-foot lake boat, under the command of Captain Gordon with a crew of 17, had passed upbound at the Sioux on November 29th, which was the day before the storm. Of course, the marine experts overlooked the fact that the Tampa was headed up to Fort William and would have been on a course that was a considerable distance to the north of Crisp Point, where the wreckage was sighted. It was also in a storm whose winds were blowing out of the west-northwest. Days later, the Tampa arrived safely at Fort William, after having sheltered behind an island to wait out the storm. So, as the maritime community took attendance on Lake Superior, there was only one lake boat that was overdue. That was the Big Steel Freighter D.M. Clemson. On December 5th, some five days after the storm had begun, the wooden lumber hooker C.F. Curtis, under the command of Captain Conlon, arrived at the Sioux. And so did the steel 500-footer Thomas Barlam. They both locked down together at 8.30 Friday evening. Along with his triple split load, of oats, wheat, and barley, the Barlum's master, Captain McIntosh, had news that his crew had spotted a huge clutter of red hatch covers in the top of a pilot house off Crisp Point. The crew of the Curtis said the same thing and added that the wreckage was spread both east and west of Crisp Point. The D.M. Clemson's hatch covers were all painted red. The final nail in the big boat's coffin came on December 9th, when the beach patrol from Crisp Point found a water barrel. It was painted white, and it had the name D.M. Clemson stenciled on one end. So how is it that the Clemson was lost in the storm, but far smaller boats, far older wooden boats, and far larger boats all survived? First, let's take a look at the Clemson herself. Launched on May 3, 1903 at Superior, Wisconsin, the vessel had been built to serve Augustus Wolven's Provident Steamship Company. She was 468 feet in overall length, 52 feet in beam, and 28 feet in depth. The boat was what was called a submarine decker, meaning that she had no aft deck houses and her crew were quartered below the spar deck aft. Her normal crew complement was 24, including her captain. She routinely carried iron ore, coal, and grain, all depending on what the price of each product was at any given time. Her hold was standard for her time, with straight sides and stanchions supporting her upper deck. The boat only had one thing working against her, luck. You see, Mr. Woven had her launched without the traditional christening. No bottle broken against her bow, and no christening words said. A September 1905 storm caused Lake Superior to board her and smash in two of her hatches. She developed a list and limped back into port in a near-sinking condition. On October 20th, 1908, she hit the Ashtabula Lighthouse Pier due to strong currents and heavy seas. That damaged 10 of her hull plates, right near her bilge at the waterline. Quote, temporary repairs, unquote, were made, and she headed out, only to ground again on Point Pelee four days later. It was said to be due to poor visibility caused by smoke. Then, just ten days before her loss, she ran into a gale on Lake Superior. The date was November 20th. She ended up staggering into the Sioux, ice-covered and in a listing condition. Yet it was claimed that her temporary repairs from the previous grounding had held. She pressed on to Lorraine, Ohio, and unloaded her ore, then took a load of coal, and headed off to Duluth on what was supposed to be her final voyage of the season. It was planned all along that her captain would retire and end his career when they got to Duluth for layup. 
Indeed, he ended his sailing days, and he took his entire crew with him. I never speculate on the causes of these disasters and the vessels gone missing. But in this case, we have at least one big clue. Aside from the temporary hull repair, most of the life jackets that were found had shown that they were previously tied to a body. And all of the bodies found had a life jacket. Which means that no matter what happened, the crew saw it coming. The final determination as to what happened is probably up to you, the viewer. As of this video, the Great Lakes Shipwreck Historical Society keeps searching for the Clemson's wreck. The DM Clemson has not yet been found. Maybe they'll find her this summer. But she will always remain overdue forever.